Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Gary's Wine and Marketplace, creating an individual shopping experience for every guest. Wells Fargo, QualCare Inc., a managed care company administering health plans that care about your health care. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. The law firm of Gibbons PC and by Verizon. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the statewide voice of business in New Jersey. And by Observer New Jersey Politics. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Normally one-on-one, -on -one. we have one-on-two -on -two today. We're pleased to welcome two very special guests. Uh, well, first, we have Albert Kelly, who is the mayor of the great city of Bridgeton, New Jersey, and Melissa Helmbrecht, who is the executive director of CASA of Cumberland, Gloucester, and Salem counties. And Melissa, CASA stands for? Court Appointed Special Advocates. Well, this is a terrific segment. One of those really positive. I hate to say feel good, but it does feel good to talk about this. Our friends at the uh, Give Something Back Foundation told us about the initiative um, that helps increase college graduation rates for uh, foster youth, if you will. Mm -hmm. Set this up for us. Who sure. are these children? Why is it so important? Um, foster youth have some of the lowest college graduation rates of any part of the population in our country. Um, about 3% of foster youth, only about 3% ever graduate from college. Mm. And more than half end up homeless or incarcerated within two years of aging out of the system. So um, providing on-ramps to attaining a college education without accumulating debt is a game changer. So mentoring them, coaching them, getting them ready, Mr. Mayor, is so important. Describe Bridgeton for those who don't know it and why its population and the demographic changes going on are so important there. Well, Bridgeton is uh, an urban area in southern New Jersey surrounded by farmland. Mm. And so uh, we're a town that's economically challenged because uh, we used to be an industrial powerhouse back in the day. Many of those businesses have left and uh, closed up or moved south. And so it has left many of our citizens struggling. And so by not having the economic background and foundation, many of our students, college would not be a, a uh, reality for them. And so we're, I'm very grateful to Bob Carr and the Give Something Back Foundation. Yeah, so the Give Something Back Foundation is so interesting as, as we, I'm gonna set this up, because there are 30 students, if I'm not mistaken here. 53. Well, okay, but what we're about to see is some video, sure. if I'm not mistaken, of some students who are being surprised because they are receiving scholarships, if I'm not mistaken, four-year scholarships. Correct. To go to college. And these are the children we're talking about right now yes. from the community. From, from the, the community. community. They're not expecting this. No. This is the announcement. Does it need any more of a setup? I don't think so. These are special kids, talented kids, mm -hmm. kids who deserve an opportunity. It speaks for itself. You're going to college for free. You're going to college for free. I remember this moment. Tell you all of you were here for me. Thank you so much for everything. It was an emotional day. Um, Describe it. They didn't know that it was coming, so uh, all they knew is that uh, someone was coming to visit with them. Someone was coming to visit. The Give Something Back Foundation. They did, they didn't, we didn't provide any setup. We wanted it to be a complete surprise. And so uh, Kelly Dunn, the executive director, came in yeah. 
and she gave the kids the news, and at first they, they weren't processing it. It took them a little while to process it. But every single um, student stood up overwhelmed, talked about how it was a life-changing moment. Students talked about how they were going to be the first in their um, family's history to go to college, how um, their parents, some are incarcerated, some are, um, you know, struggling with drug addiction, and they just couldn't wait to tell their parents that they were going to break the cycle and that they were going to be successful. It was an extraordinary moment, probably one of the best moments of my life, just to be there and witness that. And, you know, we don't all get to experience winning the lottery, but I think that that's probably a similar experience that happens once in maybe a thousand lifetimes. Yeah. I, I happened to be at the announcement for the first 23 students. Yeah. And just like Melissa said, it was a similar... You right in the room. ...outcome. I was not aware originally, so I was uh, dumbfounded also, that each student who applied to the Give Something Back Foundation, the, uh, they decided to award a scholarship to every student who applied. Four years. Four years. They keep the grades up. Got to keep a B average. And they, the good thing about the foundation is they work with mentors who mentor the kids so that they have a greater likelihood of keeping that B so they can su succeed. Now, you have succeeded. You are the mayor. You've overcome some incredible challenges. What do you see for these kids? I see a, a bright future. I see them. See, I know some of the kids personally. Mm. And small community. Small community of 25,000 plus. And uh, I worked for some of the kids this summer. They are, their parents are migrant workers and they work on the farms. And so it gives the students a, a great future. And my hope as mayor is that some of the students will return back to Bridgeton and give something back in that way, in their own way also, so that we can enrich the community mm -hmm. and keep the, keep the ball rolling and keep the, uh, break the cycle. Yeah, speaking about the cycle, this is investing not just in these young people, this is investing in the community. How so? Well, we have a community with the highest rates of child abuse and neglect in the, in the state. Um, and for the 30 young people who Bob decided to uh, rescue, they are going to break the cycle. They're going to be leaders. And, um, it, you know, what working with the kids, we know what they're going to do and the contribution that they're going to make. And I also think it just gives the whole community hope. The look on their <laughs> parents' faces when they found out. Um, all of the folks just, you know, going anywhere in the community, people are talking about it. This is a big deal in town. It's a huge deal. Big, t big deal in town. Like what are people you, saying? As you said, uh, it's a small town and it's, it, it's about pride because perhaps not my student, my, my child, uh, received a scholarship, but my neighbor's child received a scholarship. Mm. And so, somebody I know. Yeah, somebody I know. And so it empowers and gives the whole community a sense of pride that small communities like such as Bridgeton have not been overlooked. Someone is investing in our community and making a difference. And so it's, it's a game changer. Let me ask you about this uh, before I let you out of here. Um, as a student of leadership, both of you experience it, see it. These are going to be future leaders, hopefully, and, mm -hmm. you know, down the road. What's the biggest leadership lesson you have learned in all this? The biggest leadership lesson um, that I've learned in all of this is that no one gets there alone, right? Every single person that has ever become a leader did so because someone like Bob Carr or a mentor or a coach or a teacher saw something mm and decided to invest um, and go the distance. There are no throwaway kids. Everyone has a talent, everyone has the ability. It, it's up to us as leaders, as adults, That's to right. help give them the necessary tools so that they can enrich their lives. And we have to give, yeah. get involved, get, get dirty and get involved. We can't uh, lead from the front. Sometimes we need to lead from the back and help yeah. push. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure you come back and give us an update. Okay. Stay with us. We'll be right back. That was great. It was really great. 
To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Recently, my colleague Joanna Gagas went on location to Camden, New Jersey, to see how one healthcare system is helping residents in New Jersey's poorest city overcome obstacles to accessing quality health care. For many residents in Camden, New Jersey, the need for health care is pressing, but the challenges of daily life often take precedence over the much needed medical services. Struggling to pay the bills, to put food on the table, and to stay safe are just some of the concerns affecting this community. Dr. Belodia, what are some of the greatest challenges in providing health care to this Camden community? I think the biggest challenges here in this community are probably so many barriers. There's financial, there's psychosocial. They have trouble getting to us. Transportation is an issue. They have trouble affording medications, seeing specialists. Um, they don't have resources, um, family support. There's a learning barrier, you know, so a lot of them don't have diplomas or high levels of education, some even reading problems. A lot of the adverse events and trauma that they see, it's amazing. This is one of the poorest cities in the country, definitely probably one of the most violent cities too in the country, so a lot of, lot of challenges. Camden is considered a food desert, meaning residents don't have access to fresh produce and ingredients and unhealthy foods are often cheaper, leading to an increase in chronic diseases. We see a lot of diabetes, a lot of obesity, a lot of heart disease. There's lots and lots of care that needs to go into those chronic conditions. So a lot of that's learning about the disease and getting more education. So it's access to care, access to quality foods, and access to information? Yes, yeah. Virtua's Kyle Will Family Health Center, located in the heart of Camden, is working to reverse some of the major obstacles that prevent Camden residents from caring for their health. They work to meet the patients where they are, physically, mentally, and emotionally. How you been? Ah, a little rusty. A little rusty. <laughs> they help individuals make better choices for themselves to improve their own health. Jerome is a, a patient of mine who really cares about his health and who's gone through a lot of challenges, really come through and improved a lot on his general medical health. I even lost weight. I lost 125 pounds. He changed his eating habits, and I saw the difference in it. You know, he was walking, exercising. During the summer months, Virtua sets up a farmer's market in the city so that residents can buy fresh produce that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. I go to the farmer's market because it has all fresh fruits and vegetables. It's near my home. And they have a dietitian up there, a nutritionist. What have you learned from talking to nutritionists, from taking the cooking class? I've learned that food can be cooked in a nutritious way. And after the class, you're uh, sent home with a bag of nutritious food and the recipe to cook that meal. We cook it here, too. So I'm excited about that, to learn how to cook food a different way because when I was growing up, a certain way you cook food. Just slapped a lot of lard in the, in the pan. You know, I ate, we used lard, and my mom threw the chicken in, and that's the way it went. So now I've learned how to, you know, fix foods a lot of different ways and really make them taste good. Perhaps most importantly, the medical team here understands that individuals can't focus on their health until their most basic needs are met. So community-based health managers work with patients outside of the clinical setting to help resolve issues like hunger and homelessness. One of the times a community-based health manager actually helped one of my patients get um, housing. This patient came in and she was in a troubled situation in her home and then, you know, through resources that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to know about, you know, she was able to uh, secure at least one year of housing, you know, for this patient. How much of this for you is building trust with the patient? Oh, trust is so important, I think, in primary care. I mean, I think that's the foundation. I mean, they, it really doesn't go anywhere unless you have their trust because it's be, besides meeting their health care needs, I mean, they have a lot of other issues going on, and we have to understand those issues and build a trust that we understand what's important to them. So the more we get that level of understanding going, everything gets better. Behavioral health is another important area that the center has focused on, specifically for the children in Camden. I'm here with Amy Quick, who's the director of the CASEL program here at Virtua. Amy, 
What does the CASEL program describe it? The CASEL program is a behavioral health program. We service children from three up to 15 years of age, and our job is to provide um, good quality therapy for children who have behavioral and emotional problems, who are struggling mostly in school and sometimes at home. What are some of the challenges that they're dealing with at home that impact the behaviors you see in the classroom? It's not just the home, but it's the environment. Um, it's their community. I think when we talk about um, children who are living in the city of Camden, they are faced with different challenges than um, children in other areas. So there are stressors in the home, which everybody faces. Parents who may be getting divorced or um, loss of family members. But here in Camden, they're also dealing with um, violence in their community. So there is a higher level of anxiety here, um, depression, PTSD. So we are um, working very hard to be sensitive to their specific needs. I'm a grandmother raising two of my grandsons with some behavioral and learning disabilities. And Castle is providing me with services to help me raise them. CASEL, which stands for Children Achieving Success Through Therapeutic Life Experiences, provides therapy and counseling services in a classroom setting, but with more one-on-one -on -one support than the kids would receive in a regular classroom. We do provide um, school for them two hours a day, but the rest of the day is about learning how to socialize better with their peers, learning how to manage their emotions better. We have a lot of children who are dealing with anger management, um, difficulty expressing themselves, so they're learning a lot when they come here. In order for the CASEL program to work, parents and guardians must be involved in the children's therapy. Our job is to also help reconnect relationships between um, mothers and their children when they've been disconnected for so long because of all the turmoil at school or the frustrations the parents are feeling. Um, and here, it, we have a moment to educate the parents about what their child is going through and about what they need and how they can support their child. By me being knowledgeable of, their, of the situation and of their disabilities is, is helping me to be sensitive to their needs and helping me not to be so overwhelmed and, you know, stressed and to be able just to function more effectively. One of the things that we're proud about is that we are a very consistent, safe environment for them. Um, and when they come here, you actually see them wanting to come here. They form positive relationships with their peers, with the staff here, and you really see a change in them. We're a short-term program, so they'll be here for about two to four months, and to see a change in two to four months is pretty powerful. Um, it's powerful for the families, for the patient, and also for the staff as well. I see the difference in my grandchildren. Um, whereas they were out of control, and now they are learning coping skills, they're learning um, how to be independent. As I see them grow and change and use um, the tools that they're learning here to build their self-esteem, it builds my self-esteem. And that's very important. It's very important. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to welcome Michael Markman, who is an art teacher in K to 8th grade at uh, the Dr. Michael Conti School in Jersey City and the CEO of Markman Design. How are you doing? It's all well. Good, good. This is part of our classroom close-up uh, initiative we do in cooperation with the uh, New Jersey Education Association. We're about to see a clip that tells a powerful story about you. When did you know you loved art? Oh, it's when I was a young child. Um, I drew a picture of Superman on my mother's wall. <laughs> and my mother loved it and my father freaked out. How old were you? I was about three, four years old. I was drawing all my life. You're into it? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you're, you're inspiring young people every day. And we're about to tell a story. And by the way, this book, Surviving the Storm, is about uh, powerful experience getting through uh, Superstorm Sandy. But let's take a look at uh, the work that our partners at 
the NGAEA are doing in connection with Classroom Club, but a close-up that tells your story better than we could. Go ahead. This is a comic book that I created called Surviving the Storm. I wrote this during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, it was very traumatic during Hurricane Sandy. We lost power for nine days, and uh, we had to figure out things to do to keep us sane. I needed something as therapy so I can get through the trauma of not having power for nine days and trying to keep my family calm as well. Every day I'd wake up about five o'clock in the morning as soon as the light would come out and I would sit downstairs in the kitchen by myself and I would draw out the events that happened the day before. We went downstairs to turn off the alarm and put as much food as we could in the freezer. I found a gas station that was open. The children act out and read the story. And then we have a discussion about what obstacles have they faced in their life? How did they overcome those obstacles? In second grade, I had trouble reading, and so I overcame it by my mom. And from that discussion, it leads into them writing a story with Ms. Faisal about their life and their obstacle. Are you guys excited to do a comic strip? Yeah. All right. It was something he was inspired about during Hurricane Sandy. It was a real life experience. He wrote it. He introduced it to me. Immediately, I wanted to tie it in with the genre of personal narratives for my students. Eventually, what we're going to do is hone in on the characteristics that he uses and use author's craft, right from Mr. Markman, to create our very own comic. I work with Ms. Faisal, and we comprise a curriculum and a unit dealing with how art is a form of communication and how comic books can promote literacy. And then we've implemented that curriculum into our classrooms and we've been co-teaching and developing this project and it's been a wonderful experience for myself, for Ms. Faisal and for the children because it's allowed them to express ideas and communicate thoughts in ways that they might not do in a normal setting in an educational environment. My comic strip is about me being bullied in first grade. Um, and it was just nerve wracking because I couldn't tell anybody because I believe that my comic, unlike any other, would inspire somebody to be bold and stand up for themselves. After I told my story, it actually made me feel better because I know it will set an example for another boy or girl out there. There are many children and people who are lost. They might have a handicap, they might, have, they might be depressed. They might not be a literary person. Their voice is important. They have abilities that may run dormant, but we're trying to help tap into them and bring them out. And I'm gonna make sure they're doing their best to keep creating and being innovators for as long as I have them in my grasp. Then we'll see what happens, but the future looks good today. What's that like for you? It was wonderful. What started out as something personal that I was doing just to entertain myself and my family became something that moved people and it became a voice for people and it came, became a voice for children. So I felt honored that I was able to give these people that experience and for children to take it and, and let it evolve. Now you've seen this classroom close-up piece many times and you're still moved. Yeah. Even today. Yeah, I mean, as an artist and a teacher, sometimes you work in a vacuum. And not everyone appreciates what you do in either field. And art sometimes is, is looked upon as something that's decorative. It's not looked upon as something that can affect major change in the world or in the classroom. Mm. So when it gets exposure, I don't just feel good for me, I feel good for the institution of education because art can propel, the arts can propel education. You believe that? You I know it. it. I know it. How do you know it? I've worked in schools. I've worked in college. I've worked in juvenile institutions. And everywhere I go, I see how self-expression uplifts people. Yeah. Your passion for teaching. A passion for teaching. A passion for creation. Passion for changing kids' lives. Absolutely. They are the future. We have to affect them. They're going to take over one, one day. <laughs> it's going to be their world. <laughs> we got to leave a foundation for you them. You know you have the gift, right? Well, I'm a humble person. I don't like to say that I have a gift. I, I, I say to that teach. I, I say I'm blessed. Yeah. I'm blessed. Yeah. I like to say that. You're giving a lot to these kids. You keep giving it every day. And uh, you honor us by the work you do every day. And you honor the teaching profession. Thank you. As well as the organization you represent. And uh, anything you want to say 
Finally, all the teachers out there you represent, 30 seconds. Uh, keep on believing what you do. Keep on working hard. We recognize that you work Sundays and while you watch the football <laughs> game. And, and we know what, we, what you do. We appreciate it. And the kids appreciate it, too. In public television, we appreciate public school teachers. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Gary's Wine and Marketplace, Wells Fargo, Qualcare Inc., NJIT, New Jersey Sharing Network, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by Verizon. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. At Gary's Wine and Marketplace, planning parties is our business. Our associates can work with you to plan the details. We offer an assortment of wine, beer, spirits, cheeses, party platters, accessories, and more. Four locations in New Jersey and at garyswine.com.